Heather um, Anakini is president and CEO of the Chicago Public Education Fund, better known as The Fund, a not-for-profit working to attract, support, and keep strong principals in Chicago's public schools. Heather is hugely passionate about schools, education, and mostly principals. So I'm gonna bring her up to this room of 300 some educators. Uh, one of the panelists asked how many, and I just went to go get a tally of how many people we actually had. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe we need to have educators here more often. I hope that most of you are members of City Club. If you're not, we can fix that really quickly for you. Um, Heather, why don't you come on up? Thanks so much. City Club is always really good to us. This is our third year here, and that was the shortest introduction yet. Um, I am from a large Italian family. None of you will offend me if you continue to eat, so please do that. We have an incredible panel assembled to talk with you today and to reflect together on some data that we want to talk about. Before I bring that panel up here, I have two tasks that I need to complete. The first is truly one of my favorite tasks. It feels really important in a room where we're gonna talk about principles to acknowledge that we have two dozen of them here with us today. So, if you are a principal in one of Chicago's district or charter, or I think we may even have some archdiocese schools, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> I would be remiss if I fail to tell you that you have an opportunity beyond clapping for the people that just stood to recognize the principals in Chicago's district and charter public schools. In partnership with Chicago Public Schools, the fund launched our first principal appreciation campaign last week. You may have seen the faces of some of the people who just stood on the CTA. You can participate in the campaign by using the information on the slide to my left or the cards, their little quarter sheet cards at your table. <coughs> the principals who just stood to be recognized are changing individual student lives by the thousands across the city of Chicago. The very least the rest of us can do is text to show our appreciation. Our principals have incredible courage and leadership, but measuring things like courage and leadership is pretty much impossible. You can appreciate it, and we just told you how to do that, but you can't fully quantify the impact our principals are having on student lives. You can measure the impact Chicago's principals are having on growth. That's my second task before I introduce today's panel. I wanna talk a little bit about student growth. You can measure it, at least a bit. You can look at the amount of learning a student does in reading or math and compare that amount of learning to what another student does somewhere else in the country. You can look at the growth a school experiences on a measure like graduation rate and look at whether or not other similar schools are growing too. When it comes to measuring student learning and growth, Chicago is already way ahead of the rest of the country. Professor Sean Reardon and his team at Stanford released a picture that shows how this works. Third graders in two cities, Chicago and Baltimore, both with really high need student populations, both starting third grade behind. In fact, Chicago's students starting third grade a little further behind their colleagues in Baltimore. But by eighth grade, those students in Baltimore are even further behind. And by eighth grade in Chicago, our students have almost caught up. By eighth grade, our students are growing more than kids in much bigger systems like New York City, and even faster than kids in systems that spend more money than we can, like Boston. 
for actual children, Chicago's growth line in this picture is the difference between starting high school with a chance at college and career success and starting high school on a path to dropping out. There are lots of theories on what we are doing here in Chicago that they aren't doing yet in places like Baltimore and New York. But in Chicago, we aren't guessing at the answer. For nearly two decades, researchers at UChicago's consortium have been telling us that one of the things we are doing right is focusing on leadership at the school level. And in another hallmark of our work here in Chicago, the education and nonprofit communities, so many people who are in this room today, have done more than just read the research. We have acted on it. I have a very cool panel that is going to come up here in just a minute, and they're going to talk about what we've done around leadership here in Chicago. But for me, it helps to think about our work over the last two decades in four buckets. First, Chicago has raised the bar. Starting about 20 years ago, we said you can't be a principal in the city of Chicago by getting a certification. You have to demonstrate that on day one, you can do the job that our children deserve. Second, we've provided better support for the people who aspire to and are leading in our schools. There are more than 600 public schools in Chicago. Not one of them is like the other. There are more than 600 principals in Chicago, and I can tell you, not one of them is like the other. So we have created preparation and support programs that meet individual leader and school needs. Third, we focused on conditions, and for this, the district gets great credit. We know that Chicago's principals work harder than principals anywhere else in America. If you have a principal at your table, ask them to tell you. The work is really hard. But in recognition of that difficult work and the incredible talent we have, the district tries to provide as much flexibility as, pro as possible. It's far from perfect. But I know principals in places like Houston, Baltimore, and LA would give a lot to have the kind of flexibility we have here in Chicago around resource allocation, staffing, and curriculum. Finally, Chicago in the last two decades has led in our ability to use information to make decisions on the ground at the school level. We have a rich history of taking data and making change in classrooms and schools. Last year, from this stage, we launched the Chicago Principal Partnership to help ensure that all organizations that are doing work in our schools have the data they need to make good decisions. The specifics of those four buckets aren't really that important, and some of our panelists will give more detail in just a moment. But what is really important is what those actions mean for students in our city. When you look at the green shading on the graph behind me, it represents improvement on principal quality according to the University of Chicago. As the green has grown, every other measure that I talked about earlier has grown too. At the elementary school, you see reading and math improving. At the high school level, you see freshmen on track and graduation rates improving too. School leadership and its quality moves at about the same rate as many of the other measures that matter to our kids. The data, whether you're looking at these individual schools or you're listening to Sean Reardon from Stanford, is absolutely clear. Great leaders make a difference, not just broadly in schools, but for individual kids. At first glance, this next slide provides another example of that kind of leadership in action. In the summer of 2011, the graduation rate for African American young men was in the 40s. Last summer, that graduation rate was up in the 60s. 
for 1,156 young men. That improvement was the difference between a high school degree and dropping out. But, and here's where it becomes clear how much more work we have to do. A gap persisted between our African American young men and the rest of the system. If we had graduated African American young men at the same rate as the rest of our students, 862 additional young men would have walked that graduation stage. Let's be real about what that means for those young men. According to a new study from New Schools for Chicago, the 862 young men who did not graduate have a 70% chance of ending up in prison. They will earn 33% less in their lifetime than their graduating classmates. And maybe most stunning, they will live an astonishing 14 years fewer than a white person with an equivalent of a bachelor's degree. That same study suggests that there are whole communities where schools are struggling with these persistent gaps and where all our focus on leadership as a city, as a nonprofit and education community still isn't reaching every child. These numbers for individual students and communities are devastating and they suggest that we have much more work to do. Before I bring the panel up to talk about the work ahead of us, I want to be clear about something. I'm optimistic. I believe that we can and will do the work. I've brought four experts who know a lot about how that's going to get done. Before I call them up here, I want you to see one more picture. I started this introduction talking about student growth. And on that measure, Chicago, the third largest public school system in the country, is an outlier. The picture shows Chicago in the top right. We grow very high need students much faster than most other large urban systems like Boston and New York. For comparison, there's Baltimore again in the bottom right. Same high need students, much different outcome. It might also be useful for this audience to note the district in the upper left. That's Winnetka, where students have fewer needs and where they spend a lot more per student than we do. Despite all their advantages, their growth lags behind ours here in Chicago. This picture gives me hope. If Chicago, with all our challenges, can lead on student growth at this level and at this scale, we can figure out how to close the gap for all of our students. We can and will develop a system where growth and graduation are a reality for every child. And we can do that by doubling down on what has already worked for us, consistent and focused investment in the people who stood a few minutes ago, in the people who lead our schools. The panel we've assembled today is here to talk about that investment in leadership under such high stakes. Please join me in welcoming Cassie, Lavise, Janice, and Anne to the conversation. All right, so before you go back to talking to the people at your table, um, I do want to get things kicked off. I talked a lot about the relationship between leadership and the outcomes we care about as a city. And we have an expert here nationally uh, to tell us a little bit about how Chicago is stacking up. So, Anne, you know, Chicago's obviously made a bunch of investments in our leaders, uh, including the launch of the Chicago Principal Partnership. If we want to get to a place where this is working for all kids, what's it going to take? Well, first, hi, everybody. I am so thrilled to be in a packed room. 
talking about this. We love to get nerdy about principles, and I'm thrilled that you all do as well. So where I think, what we like to think about going, where we go next is looking at the systems level at a district about all the elements that connect to help us find support and keep the very best principles in the very best spots. Chicago has done this in an incredible way. You can see behind me right now a framework. It needs a jazzier name, so if you come up with one, please let me know. We call it the Principal Talent Management Framework. And this is our attempt to capture those elements that connect a principal's life cycle, if you will, in a district. So it starts with preparation. At the Bush Institute, our work in school leadership, which goes back several years, started with preparation. And we very quickly realized there are lots and lots of connected elements that go into whether a principal can be successful and sustain a successful career over the long term. So we start with preparation. We go into how do we recruit and select principals into their roles? How do we provide the right kind of professional learning for them in their roles at different points? Principals at different points in their career need different things. That seems obvious, but we don't always differentiate in terms of how we support them. It goes into how we evaluate those principals um, in their roles. It goes Then it connects to how we compensate and incent them um, to do the work that they do. And all of that is undergirded by something we call working conditions, which covers all manner of sins. So that includes, does a principal actually have the right kind of earned autonomy to do what they need to do, to hire, to develop curriculum, to decide on goals and a culture for a, a school? Do they actually have the time to focus on instruction or are they busy fixing broken windows, leaks, a boiler, a bus schedule, right? The principals in the room know all the things that can suck up time that take away from what you're trying to do for instruction. So if this kind of thing is exciting to you, go to bushcenter.org. You can look at a very um, a whole framework that we've put together undergirded by research that exists either from what works clearinghouse, expert opinion, other things that you can see that's a guide for districts around if you're trying to make these connections, we think this is really important. So. And I, I oh, you know, we use the framework. We yeah. love your framework because we're really nerdy about principles. Um, but I know for some of the folks in the room, a lot of what we want to understand is how does Chicago stack up? Because it's a really competitive room. So it is. Yes. can you talk about that? I have good news for you all. Um, OK, so if we look at Chicago, you'll see that top row there, some yellow and green check marks, how you're doing connecting those buckets that I just described in the system. We don't have a formal ranking, but we would informally put Chicago in our top 5% of districts. Most districts would look like that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to pause. That's very important. This is a big, a BFD as someone said. This is important. So. Um, an average district there is, you'd see more yellows and reds. And part of how we know this is we're about to launch a cohort of districts who are gonna help us test this framework. Um, we work for uh, President Bush, the guy whose name is on our building, who also is very engaged, and he's like, so you've made a report, so what? Go test it and make sure it's right. So that's what we're about to do with these districts. We spent a lot of time looking at applications and on-site visits. There's a lot of people that say principles are important. There's very few districts that are doing the kind of thoughtful work we see here in Chicago about making that happen. Thank you. Um, it's really helpful, I think, to put into context what I was talking about in terms of the investments that Chicago has made over the last 20 years. And I know I'm kind of holding Janice back here because what she wants to talk about is how she's going to turn those yellows to green. We're expecting um, it. But before I let her talk about that, I really want to um, bring this down to what it means at the school level. So I'm competitive, too. I like seeing all those greens. It makes me really happy. But it doesn't matter if it isn't changing what's possible for actual principals in schools, that report. You've got to get out there and test it. And we're so lucky today because we have one amazing principal representing many amazing principals here on the panel. Lavise is truly a transformational leader, um, changing outcomes for our most vulnerable kids. Many of you have been to Lovett Elementary School. They love it at Lovett. <laughs> It's located on Chicago's west side, and it's one of the neighborhoods highlighted in the map that I showed where schools really are struggling to make this work. He serves 400 students, about 86% of whom are African American and 90% of whom are low income. And we have a picture of this because I think it's so cool to see what that, uh, his work has meant at Lovett. 
you can see uh, Lovett started um, in that bottom corner with many other schools uh, when Levis took over uh, at Lovett. And all of those schools, those high need schools, have improved over the course of the last several years. But at Lovett, they've done more than improve. They've exceeded the district average. Now, there's lots of people in the room that want to hear all about how Lavise did that. Um, <laughs> and I encourage you to go see it in action. But what I want him to talk about right now is what it's meant as a principal, what sorts of supports have mattered in trying to drive those numbers in the way that he's done it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Wow, it's really, really cool to see <laughs> that sort of, it's like, wow, is that my, our school? Uh, Truly I'd just amazing. like to point out that we highlighted Dr. Haney like five years ago as a principal to watch, so we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we cool. just figured that yeah. out. I'd like to point out that the rest of the country can stop watching him. We're keeping him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's appropriate to start with principal preparation. And I went to two amazing universities, Northeastern Illinois University as well as Loyola University of Chicago. And the focus, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and for us in our leadership preparation, the focus was transformational leadership and servant leadership. And the bottom line is we exist to serve others and not the other way around. And so that's where we start from our framework. And second is this shift to an instructional focus. We, we truly do spend the majority of our time uh, focused on instruction. And so uh, beyond my preparation program, I have to, I have to give credit to my chief, uh, Randall Jossaran, who has given principals like myself customized uh, support, uh, really have given principals like me strategies that have, in essence, really transformed our school. Um, next is the district's metrics. Um, at one point, if a student was under, uh, was performing under grade level, it would be a long climb for that student to achieve at the same level as their other uh, colleagues or other students, rather. And in our district, we celebrate growth. And so a school like ours, who have our students have traditionally underperformed, so now we can get excited about growth. And there's no excuse to, to not growing. Every kid can grow. And so at Love It, we celebrate that. And our kids, they stick their chests out about that now. <laughs> so they're very, very excited so about Lavise, their growth. So, I'm going to interrupt you there, because I, I think students and how they feel when you talk about growth is a part of what's powerful when you walk through a school like Love It. Can you just give the audience an example of a student who's been powerfully impacted by the kind of work that you've done? Well, I have an interesting story about one of our students, actually a former student. Uh, let's call him Raekwon. <laughs> so Raekwon, this kid was lived in the discipline office. So I knew him very, very well. Uh, always disrupting the class, always out of his seat, always running the halls. And so last year, I walked into the middle school building, and who was in the hallway? Raekwon. <laughs> Except this time, he was actually working on a project. And so I walked up to Raekwon and I said, uh, son, what are you working on? And so he was excited about this project he was working on. And he, he talked about how it, it aligned with his learning goals and, and, and all of these different things he was doing with his project. And so I peeked my head in the classroom because we're all about student agency, but this is Ray Korn we're talking about here. <laughs> and so I'm giving the teacher a look like, you know, what's going on? And so she proudly uh, explained what he was working on. And I found out some very cool news this year. I spoke to uh, a high school representative at the high school fair, and guess where Raekwon is going now? Uh, a school called Legal, uh, Legal Charter Prep Academy. So this kid, instead of going to the neighborhood school where he could have gotten lost, I mean, this is Raekwon here, uh, he's now in a smaller environment that really fits his needs. Mm. I love that story. Yeah. And I know uh, some of us in the room have had the privilege of being at Lovett, and Cassie, you've, you've been there a few times, I think. Um, I think CME has been just an incredible partner in the work, in part because you spend a lot of time in schools. 
And philanthropy has had an important role to play here in Chicago in the working conditions that you talked about, Anne. So Cassie, I thought maybe I'd give you a chance to talk about CME and the philanthropic community's role in helping to support schools like Lovett. Sure, well, it's a pleasure to be um, with you today, Heather, and, and the panelists and the audience. Um, at first, I want to acknowledge um, the other funders in the audience. So I counted up this morning. There are 60 foundations and corporate giving programs that support Chicago public schools um, here in Chicago, and that's a lot. And mm -hmm. we collaborate, we work together, and I have so many colleagues here um, that, uh, that Really, uh, we couldn't do what we do without us all working together. Um, CME Group Foundation, um, our charter is advancing the economy through education from cradle to career. So we fund early childhood, K-12, and post-secondary education, all focused on low-income communities in Illinois and predominantly Chicago. So um, it's been such a pleasure to partner with um, as well as the other foundations with Chicago Public Education Fund over the last four years and really help um, bring principal leadership to the fore. Um, we have many um, or other organizations we also partner with um, in our early childhood area. We focus on early math education, so professional development for teachers of young children. And we have some great partners in Erickson Institute, DePaul University, uh, UIC, and University of Chicago who are working with teachers in CPS schools grades K through five every day. We also work with our wonderful Computer Science for All office. We're the largest funder of Computer Science for All in Chicago Public Schools. And we're so thrilled to be able to um, have computer science be a graduation requirement now in CPS, as well as available to most K-8 students. And then finally, we also are focused on the use of technology to personalize learning. And we really believe that that's something that will help all of our students uh, maximize their own personal potential. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Cassie. I know I do want to give you a chance. You've been to love it and you've seen it. What did it look like to you? So, it, um, I, with one of my trustees, I visited love it about six months ago and uh, had a tour with Dr. Haney. And I've got to tell you, it was um, one of the best visits ever. Um, just walking through the hall where you could see students sitting on their beanbag pillows working um, either by themselves on their laptops, on their Chromebooks, working on their own specific projects that they were most interested in, or working in small groups. And then we walked into the classroom and we saw the teacher working with a small group of students. We saw other students working in their own small groups, learning those 21st century skills that our foundation really believes are so important to all students, like teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking. And then we also saw individual students with their little headphones on working at their own individual computers at their own speed. And for struggling students, this really helps them um, to advance as much as they can and really have that growth. But for those students who are already at grade level, this really helps them excel. So they're not being held back. They can go at their own pace. So it was just an amazing experience and I wanna thank you so much for allowing us to visit. Thank you for so I, what I think is really interesting about that, first of all, this doesn't look anything like the schools most of us have spent our lives <laughs> attending. Uh, and it isn't just love it. There are dozens and dozens of schools across the city of Chicago that look like this and that have leaders that are driving the kind of change that Cassie just described. The other thing that doesn't look very similar to what others might experience is the way that Cassie just talked about the work of the nonprofit and philanthropic communities. I spent a lot of my career going from city to city and working with districts all across the country. And Chicago is really the only place where Philanthropy comes together and thinks about strategy in support of the districts and the larger community's vision in the way that it does here in Chicago. 
I know I've been holding Janice off because um, I wanted <laughs> to let others um, share their perspective. And because she is so passionate about the work of principals in our city, um, we've had at the fund a lot of luck um, in working with her on principal leadership. And I'd just like to give her a chance to talk about what it's going to take to see the dozens of examples like Love It spread across the 600 schools in our city. Thank you, Heather. What she left out was talkative. That's why they made me <laughs> <laughs> go last. And the true debater in me is going to go through and offer a rebuttal for every mm. single thing. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's, it's not that type of crowd. But I do want to comment on a few of the things that were raised today. Um, first, starting with LaVis, um, obviously just, just moved sitting here as a former principal, thinking about um, Love It and all that he's been able to accomplish. But the thing, and I want to share this especially with so many principals in the room, the thing that stood out the most for me when I had an opportunity to visit is that he truly embodies what I think is a critical leadership attribute or tenet and that is that he chooses to challenge versus control students so when I walked through that school and I saw students sitting in the halls that's not uncommon to me I worked at a selective enrollment school we offered our students a lot of flexibility and we challenged them but unfortunately as the leader of this district I walk into a lot of schools where I don't see that level of challenge I see a lot of control control and constraint and I just want to acknowledge that you know there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of ingredients to the secret sauce that love it, but one of the things that I really want to make sure people know about him is that he's made a choice to challenge his students, and I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, the second piece is just want to thank Ann Wicks, who really gave me an answer to a question that I would get often, which is, how do you know? Because I would just say Chicago is number one at principal preparation, <laughs> and I'm going to keep saying that because it sounds like there's no true metric yet, so Go you can it. just say anything <laughs> nowadays <laughs> if, if nobody... You actually can say it even if people refute you, which is sad. But anyway, I'm going to choose yeah. to say one. I live in Dallas. Yeah. You can say it. No one will come find yeah. you. Know? But the thing is, people would always ask, how do you know Chicago's at the top? And I would talk about the work at the fund, talk about the philanthropic community. But it was just so great and reaffirming to see the amount of research that went into the framework um, and to see how Chicago measures up, but also some places where we absolutely need to grow as a district. So thank you for, for giving me an opportunity to answer that question. And then finally, just want to reiterate rate um the support uh, from the philanthropic community thank you cassie for um making that clear uh it's no secret that the past few years financial stability has been a huge huge um crisis and and problem that we've tried to solve here in CPS and beyond the support that we receive through that I think it, it's also important to know that when I talk to other leaders across the country it's very rare that you find the kind of ecosystem that we have here in Chicago and you know so I want to thank you for that but also say that given the crisis that we just managed to get through it's always good to know who your friends are so I want to thank those of you who were here to support us and and now we're ready to do bigger and bolder things and so recently CPS released this vision, uh, and the vision has three critical components. Number one was uh, bringing about more fiscal stability, as I pointed out earlier. And as we talk about the results from the principal survey um, today that Heather uh, talked about, we know that a lot of um, the, the conditions for success that principals um, were concerned about can be directly attributed back to um, some of those things. So one of the things that we're really excited about is, um, number one, the fact that now that there is more uh, certainty with funding in the district that we will be able to roll out the budgets earlier. So we're looking at an early spring rollout of our budgets, which I know is a principle. Yeah, I was waiting on the clap for that one. <laughs> You know, I, I hate to say this, I was a principal for 11 years. I remember when we used to get the budget in January, shout out to Christina Herzog, because I know you were in the budget office then. Um, and we want to get back to that, but I think April gives us definitely a fighting start so that you can do a better job planning, um, that you can attract um, high quality teachers in your building, which is also a big part of our vision. But I also know it's critically important for academic stability that you can't change teachers, you know, mid-summer. You know, I heard the, the saddest quote I heard from a principal once is that this is the first time I could not introduce the t students to their teacher next year because we didn't know what was going to happen. So that is gone away. So I'm really excited about that. The other piece is that as a district, I think we've done a lot to um, control spending. Um, I know uh, 
Forrest and his team, his uh, financial team have done a really good job restructuring some of the debt and really just, again, bringing all, all people to the table, all of the stakeholders to the table so that we can come up with the solution. And I, the reason I start with that is because as an educator, of course, um, academic performance is what's critically important. But what we also know is that if you don't have the finances and the resources, it's hard to get it done or you get it done on the backs of principals, teachers and other people just giving more than they actually should be giving um, in order for us to be uh, you know, successful, and the principals and teachers in CPS have done just that um, over the past few years. But as we go into um, this next school year, I'm feeling really excited and invigorated about our focus on instruction. I heard Principal Haney say we're focused on instruction, and that's absolutely what principals need to be focused on. And I think the work that we've done with um, the Leadership Co Collaborative, now the Chicago Principal Partnership, will help us really cement that. Um, I get a chance to travel across the country and talk about all the great work that you all are doing. And the one thing that I talk about is the fact that principal leadership is the critical lever. And I don't say it because it's a good sound bite. I don't say it because it's the best job I ever had. And yes, I know exactly what I just said. It's the best <laughs> job I ever had. Um, I miss the Raekwons and I can list a whole bunch of them. But I get to go and talk about that and I get to say that we're focused on the right things and what's, that's what's happening in the classroom. And I think that that's going to help us tackle some of the other issues that we're looking at as we go forward. And uh, just just to highlight a few of those, um, number one, and it was just talked about this weekend, is declining enrollment um, in not only the city of Chicago, but in particular on the south and west side. So really stabilizing those communities, stabilizing the instructional experience for students so they don't want to leave, so they have a reason to stay, is something that's critically important. Um, improving the quality of our high schools. We have made a lot of dramatic growth as a district, but I still know, having led high schools my entire life, that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there. So this year there is a laser-like focus on the quality of instruction in our high schools. And then finally, just making it more accessible. So the launch of Go CPS has been a personal um, achievement for me because I think it I think it's going to really change the game. We talk a lot about equity and access, but it's not often that we have policies that we can point to. So just really excited to see what the possibilities are when we have more parents um, engaged in that process and making choices for their children and more students feeling empowered about their future. I think that's the next edge of growth. That's the vision for Chicago Public Schools. And I want to thank everybody in this room who plays some part in helping us realize that vision. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. Mm -hmm. I want to I talk about what that vision means for vulnerable schools in particular, for those communities and schools that I put up on the map earlier. Those are places where we're still struggling to find the right mix of great leadership and support for principals to lead. And Anne, I thought maybe you could give some perspective on what you're seeing nationally districts yeah. do uh, when they want to invest in vulnerable communities. Uh, this is where it gets so interesting and compelling, I think, for us, and something we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, one option, or one example that I'll offer to you is actually happening in Dallas, where where we uh, live. That district, like Chicago, has had lots of politics, lots of up and down, lots of funding challenges, and they have landed on a strategy. We've got about a year's worth of data that is so promising, all arrows pointing up, we expect to see this grow and continue over time, where they've created essentially a SEAL Team 6 of principals and educators who are willing to go work in the most, the schools serving our most vulnerable children. And that means that it's, it's a badge of honor. If you are a principal who's gonna go teach in this school, or lead this school, you get to have some selection over your faculty. These are all our best instructor, instructors who are coming to these schools. They get a financial incentive to come take on this work. There is a recognition this takes our very best educators, and it is a lot of work, and you should be rewarded for the skills and experience that you're bringing to these vulnerable kids. And like I said, this has been in place for, uh, we've got about a year's worth of data where we're seeing uh, student outcome scores go up in all the ways that we would hope for these kids. So that's an example of something that's really promising. Yeah. I'll tell you the solutions that you'll see that look like this might vary from city to city, which is fine, right? Every city's a little different and that's fine. The solutions will come from things like the Chicago Principal Partnership, the people who are looking at data and focused on that together, groups like this. We use 
Chicago is one of our examples at the risk of pandering, but I'll pander to this <laughs> crowd. Um, we, one of our other strands of work is thinking about city and regional based solutions because so much of what's going to happen and change is going to happen at the city and regional level. The folks, the ecosystem that Janice was referring to that you all have in Chicago is really unparalleled. And it does not surprise us that you have the kind of innovation and success that you have. It's, it's not a coincidence and it's really a thrill to see it in action. And I, I do think one of the things that Chicago does well is learn from other cities. Uh, you saw Janice taking notes, I was taking notes yeah. too. Those kinds of examples are the sorts of things that help drive what we do at the fund and what the system thinks about doing for principals broadly. Another thing that I mentioned earlier that we do really well is pay attention to data. Um, and we, every single year, survey all of the principals across the city of Chicago, charter and district. We have almost an 80% response rate year over year. And our most recent survey had some interesting findings that I think are worth sharing with this group. Uh, you know, top line, you can see that principal satisfaction is down a bit from 69% from last year to 65% this year. There was a lot going on uh, when that survey was given. Janice mentioned the stability on the financial side. When this survey was taken, Springfield had not yet released a budget, um, which was their habit until very recently. And so there's some of that worked into the numbers. Interestingly though, when you dig into the rest of the data, there's something else going on there that I think as a city, we have to figure out how to embrace and react to. Fewer principals are reporting that they'll look for a job in the next year. Three out of five principals are saying that they would stay five years or more. Principals like Lavis, who we really want to keep in the city, are saying they would if we can do something about issues like school funding, compliance, and compensation, all issues that Janice just talked about the district's response to. And then 13% more principals are saying that their management organization communicates a vision that is motivating. CPS has put out a vision, which I think has really helped motivate its district leaders. And the charter community has some pretty powerful vision to communicate as well. Lavis mentioned his chief, his direct manager, who's worked hard to try and move things there. So one of the things I'm excited about in the city of Chicago is using data like this to work together going forward and doing that in the context of what principals say. So Lavis, you're the only one that gets to react to this survey data, at least on this panel. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit about what you see happening here? Well, the biggest piece certainly was uh, the financial uh, situation um, in that we, you know, we need our, our, our funding to really keep and maintain our, our, our academic programs. And our, our teachers and staff really felt the uncertainty. I mean, it's hard not to. They're seeing things on the news. They're worried about furlough days, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so having a successful start to the school year this year uh, has really been a, a, a relieving factor. I, mm -hmm. I, I know I can speak for, for, for my colleagues and that we, we, we can see the, the, the light at the end of the I know we tunnel. feel it when yeah. we're out in schools. It does feel like everyone took a deep breath. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you um, maybe just really quickly, so that everyone in the room is hearing it, talk about what keeps you in Chicago's public schools? <laughs> Besides me saying to everyone that you can't go anywhere. <laughs> well, there's so much that keeps us uh, in the building. I mean, uh, in, in this district, I mean, one thing that this district has done a tremendous job of is engaging principals like me, and I see some of my colleagues in the room. Like, we really, truly have a voice in, in, in the district is hearing us and, and we can see uh, that the district has been responsive. I mean, I know no one wants to talk about money, mm -hmm. right? See, because we don't do this for money, mm -hmm. you know, but, but yet the district has been very, very responsive. And it's it, one, of the, one of the biggest things that, that happened after we've gotten some, uh, mm -hmm. some stability financially is to address uh, principal compensation. Mm -hmm. So that was a big piece for us. And I know our, me and my colleagues really appreciate yeah. the district. Heather. Can I say something yeah. about Just two points on compensation, and i um, glad I didn't bring it up first to let you guys get it, <laughs> although I'll take all those uh, uh, points of gratitude. But two things that were critically important for me, um, having served as a principal for 11 years, is you never really knew when you were going to get a raise, and I thought that that was wrong. You know, you would hope you might get something when a new contract came out. You would hope that it was calculated properly once enrollment went up 
not when it went down. Um, but I really thought that it was important for people to know how they will be compensated, when raises would occur, so that was critically important. But the other thing that was really um, groundbreaking, I think, for us is that we got closer to um, providing principals with additional support through the signing bonus for those who decide to go into our hard, uh, most need schools and hard to staff schools. And that's something that I know the district has tried, you know, different variations of over time and, you know, maybe didn't have as much success. We tried the bonuses and different things like that. But I really am happy that we're able to incentivize people to go into some tough schools because I've had the opportunity to work in both. And it's hard working in both, but I really do understand that it takes a special person, um, not only a special person, but a special skill set in order to be successful in those schools. Yeah. And I, I know that that compensation mm -hmm. component came out of conversations with about 20 principals mm -hmm. that helped advise the district on what that compensation setup should look like. Yep. So it was really fostered by principal voice mm -hmm. and their perspective on the work. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of years, principals have been asking for a lot of support in our survey every year. Compensation came up over and over, and when the district was able to address that, I was really proud to see that they did. Uh, but supports from a professional development perspective have come up over and over again, too. And at the fund, we've really worked to help fill that void in some important ways, and we couldn't do that without the support of the larger philanthropic community and CME in particular. So Cassie, I'm just wondering if you can talk about when you read our survey data and you see the kinds of needs that principals have from a program perspective, how you think about your investments going forward. Sure. Well, CME Group Foundation um, really tries to invest in education at a systems change level. So although we think it's terrific for uh, foundations or corporations to invest in um, individual schools in order to have the biggest impact that we can over multiple schools and over a district. That's how we try to make our investments. So we made our first investment in the Chicago Public Education Fund in 2014 of a million dollars. And we really, um, based on the wonderful work of the staff and of the board and of all the partners at CPS, um, saw some terrific uh, results in terms of the numbers of high-performing principals going from 150 to 350 in four years. That's pretty amazing. And when I put that slide up for my trustees um, a couple weeks ago at our last foundation board meeting, they were like, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good metric. So um, today I am absolutely delighted to announce that CME Group Foundation is making an anchor commitment in the Chicago Public Education Fund's next piece of work, Fund 5, of another million dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, we just can't be more pleased to do so. So I knew that was coming, and if I could have had balloons, I would have. <laughs> um, but we're really, we're so grateful for CME's investment in our work and for the investment of many others in the room. I think, Janice, mm -hmm. this is where I'd like you to have the last word mm -hmm. and just talk about what an investment of another million dollars communicates mm -hmm. about Chicago and the way that we think through leadership. Um, you know, I, I, I choose to do that by highlighting a few examples. Um, obviously, when we think about principal retention, we are looking to see a reduction. And I think CPS has done a, a, an amazing job. Our retention rate is somewhere around 17 or 18 percent, which is fairly low for a large urban school district. And we're really excited about that. But until we can you know, consistently have a high quality principal in every school and have a sustainable plan if that principal chooses to leave, uh, we're not gonna be able to meet all of our goals as a district. And I just wanna talk about a few examples of where we have seen principals go in and really do remarkable work. Um, I'll start with, I don't wanna say a turnaround situation, but, I, somebody could describe it as a turnaround situation um, from inside out, which is when um, Allison Tingwall took over Curie High School. And I was not in this role at that time, but played a really big role in making sure they picked the right person because at the time people thought I knew a little bit about high schools. And it was a, it's a huge high school, and I knew that you needed somebody who really understood system, a systematic approach to leading a school. Um, and with some leaders who led the school before that were beloved for many different reasons, I knew that if a school like Curie is still sought after by many people in the community, still seeing enrollment increases, that it was imperative that the district make sure that there's a person in there who could really lead that. So investments like this in Fund 5 invest in leaders. And I know that Allison 
as a new leader has been intimately involved in so many of the different programs that the fund and, and other organizations offer. Um, she's also on UIC, so shout out to UIC. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, that's, that's really what it's all about, putting a high quality leader in the school, somebody who can either turn a situation around and put it on the right path, or um, people who can start new uh, schools and innovate in a way and create something that wasn't there before. So another example that stands out to me, um, and I just saw in the crowd, is uh, Beulah McLeod over at Diet. And you know, that was kind of, a, you know, people heard about Diet, and that was a situation. Um, but one of the best things we could do was put a high quality principal in there. And if you notice, as soon as we uh, selected Beulah and put her in, a lot of the craziness just kind of died down. And that's not by chance. That's because we had somebody who was not only a skilled instructor, I mean, educator, but also a person who really believed in community, authentic community engagement. And as a result, was able to open that school successfully and to create a school that not only the district is proud of, but more importantly, everybody on the south side, and I would even say citywide is very proud of. And you know, I look at everybody's data, so when I see them, I can make comments. And you know, first year level one, so I want to give it up to Diet for that. But we. We know achieving level one, level one plus status, those things are great, um, but the best way uh, to really know if a school is doing well is to look at enrollment. And I know when we opened the school, some people said, you know, there are no kids um, on the south side. They're moving, they're leaving, they're going to these different places. And last year, uh, I mean, this past year, with 150 seats available, I believe they had over 300, you know, more than that uh, uh, applications in a long waiting list. I don't want to quote the wrong number, but it was pretty remarkable. So again, we took a place that people thought wasn't viable based on numbers and demographics and put a good principal in there. And now it's a level one school on the south side of Chicago and it's a high quality option in the community for our children. So I want to thank Principal McLoy for, for her tremendous work and all of the principals in this room who have individual stories that I can share up here to talk about how you have not only transformed schools but transformed communities. So thank you on behalf of the district. So we're going to take a few questions in just a second, but I want to just uh, play back that we've heard some really great examples. Allison, Beulah, Lavis, we tried to play that example up, mm -hmm. big and proud. These are individual principals, but they're impacting thousands of kids every day in their schools. But at the start of today's conversation, I tried to highlight neighborhoods and communities where we're still struggling to find that right combination of leadership and programmatic support. And CME's investment in the fund and the investment of so many people in this room, it's really about finding a way for every kid. Not just for some kids, not for just some communities, but for every kid. And in order for that to happen, literally every organization in this room needs to come to the table with CPS, with the charter community, and help us figure it out. We need to think about what's possible for each community, for every child, and for every school. We have to do that by taking a bet on incredible leaders like the ones we learned about today, and by ensuring that they have the support they need to do incredible work. Thanks for joining us, and please send your questions on up to the front. I think we're doing lightning round, which means 30 seconds to answer any question, and Destiny is going to hold us true to that. Um, and we'll start with some pre-submitted questions from Thomas Brown at Edgenuity, a City Club member. Considering the state of CPS historically and currently, leading our nation, which was the title today, is a big task. Janice, what's the estimated time frame for CPS to become a recognized national education leader? I, I would say we're already recognized. Um, and yeah, so let's clap for that. It's, it's, I, I appreciate that question. And it made me think about a comment I shared with my table mates last week when we were at the Council of Great City Schools, which is a convening of all of the large uh, districts throughout the country. And everybody in there, they wanted to come to all of our sessions. And I intentionally took a big crowd because I really wanted to spread the, the good word. Um, but then I was floored when Bill Gates, and I'm telling everybody, everybody yeah. that would listen, that Bill Gates unscripted when asked what cities should we be looking at, who's doing great work, he called out Chicago. And he did it not once, but three different times. And we have the Facebook link to prove it. So if anybody wants to see it. So, so, 
You but know what, you hit national yeah. standing. But right, but yeah. what I say that because one of the things we shared at our table is that we wish that that message was penetrating um, locally. And I think that it does in this room. So to people in here, it's like, yeah, we get it. But we do need your help sharing that good news and amplifying that message. With regard to a time frame, I don't have an exact time frame, but if you look at our strategic vision, what we are talking about is not only continuing on this pathway, but closing some of the achievement gaps that Heather talked about. For me, I'm never gonna be satisfied until I can look at a list and not predict that African-American students, in particular African-American males, are at the bottom. And so it's really great to see the movement that was pointed out with regard to freshmen on track and graduation rates, but I'm not gonna be satisfied until we see, see that in a more more aggressive way because that's what our kids deserve. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna combine two questions and take the moderator's mm -hmm. uh, prerogative and answer them. Um, so Christopher Carlson from Fulcrum and Katie Welsh from CPS Ravenswood Elementary School both asked questions around how the fund is helping to support school leaders broadly and in addition how we're supporting local school councils in their principal candidates to network with one another. So I wanna call attention, last year on this stage, we announced the Chicago Principal Partnership, which is a partnership between CPS, the fund, and 20 other organizations citywide that are dedicated to doing those two things. To making sure that we take the survey data and information we receive from principals and from local school council members whom we also survey, and use that information to make different kinds of decisions. We're not gonna go from you know, a, a retention rate of 83% to a retention rate of 98% tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go there by paying attention to that information year by year, and year by year, increasing our retention and support for great principals like the ones you met today, working together and with all of the organizations that are touching our schools. All right. Um, and then the last question, this one um, is for Janice as well from uh, Leighton Olson, uh, Internet Public Trust City Club member. Do your high school CPS leadership unions plug into regular career exploration pipelines like those for next September's Smart Force Student Summit at McCormick Place? Um, I'm not aware of that summit, but if you could stop by and see somebody at my table, would love to get more information. But what I will say is that people, there was a lot of coverage for our Learn, Plan, Succeed initiative, um, which some people remember as the mayor saying everybody's going to go to college. And that is not exactly what we announced and one of the key components was the importance of career education. And so would love to plug in more. I would say that as a district, we made the right choice to focus on college as a destination. But one of the things that we've realized over the past five to 10 years is that we did not spend as much time on the career exploration and, and preparation piece. And so we are trying to fix that. And that's why the Chicago Bills program at Dunbar, I would say that's the first large initiative that we've done uh, done to, to address that. And we hope to do more on, in other parts of the city. So would love to know more about that summit and use that as something that we can plan towards. But I'm unfamiliar with it at this time. Yeah. I, think, I think we're done with questions. Is that, mm -hmm. or do you guys, that's all I have for pre-submitted, yep, I okay. I believe that was all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, let's give them all a round of applause.